Greetings, beloved, and welcome back to another amazing virtual summit. I am your host, Coach Felicia Killings, and I am really excited about what God continues to do through this ministry um, and through a lot of the different voices that I bring to the platform. Now, I know a lot of you know me for talking that political talk and uh, whatnot, but there is more to our movement than just politics. That's also dealing with the social aspect basically dealing with how we interact with people, building relationships, um, you know, creating successful marriages and whatnot. All of these things are so vital and, and important. And so that is what we are bringing into our amazing women's ministry, which is called My Beloved Women's Virtual Ministry. Now, in just a quick moment, I'm going to introduce you to a dear friend of mine. She is back in California. And um, I forget how we met, but she and I will we'll talk about our story a little bit. She's a, an amazing doctor when it comes to understanding mental, uh, mental health issues and how we can better our ourselves, especially for those of us in the Black community. And so without further ado, I want to introduce you to Dr. Lakita Long. All right there. Are you, can you hear me? I can gladly hear you. Thank you so, so much. Why don't you just go ahead and start off. Tell us about yourself, your background, and then we'll get into the more professional stuff. Awesome. Uh, so welcome, uh, everybody. I'm just so excited to be here. It's an awesome, awesome privilege and pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Felicia. You know, when I get an opportunity to speak, um, I really, I'm always still nervous, even though I've been doing this for like 30 years. Um, and primarily because I think we only have a few moments to say something to impact people's lives. And because mental health, uh, the mind is so fragile, as strong as it is, it is so fragile and it can split in like two seconds. And so, or it can expand in two seconds. The variance is, is one way or the other. Um, so I'm just grateful to be here and excited to have the opportunity to talk about something I love, love, love. Um, so I got into this field uh, really because I um, had mental health issues. Um, yeah. As a kid growing up, uh, in Long Beach, California, born to uh, two parents that were pretty old. I, uh, you know, my dad was 50 when I was born. So they, they were old back in that day. You were old, <laughs> you started having kids at 50. And, and I was number six out Woo! of the seven that they will have, right? So my father was in the Navy. My mom just was a stay-at-home mom and just kind of traveling wherever. Um, but mental health became very, very real and apparent. And I started to see various things within myself after I had a, uh, a sexual assault uh, towards me from a family member, uh, I mean, a family friend at the age of mm -hmm. eight, just one time, uh, just all it takes is one, one time. Yeah. And from about eight to about 11, my life just started just pivoting in a, a really massive way. Uh, and that became the entry point along with my brother uh, being diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. So mm -hmm. those, those two areas is what fuels me every single day uh, because people are misinformed, especially African-Americans. They are mm. misinformed about mental health, about what we can do to better our health and, and, and what is it that God has equipped us to be able to do. So that's just a little bit about what I love it. I do. Awesome. So I want us to begin by pretty much defining mental health. And the reason is because, well, you and I, we, um, it's nothing for us to combine the spirit and our profession. Yes. Um, I, I have no problem with it. And a lot of us know how to maneuver that. So in the church sphere, discussing mental health is kind of like akin to talking about the devil in, you know, like, oh, that's just, just cast out that spirit and it'll be. And so there's just been this bad stigma when it comes to mental health. Um, and so if you don't mind, go ahead and give us a very brief definition that we can walk away with to understand what mental health is. And I actually, um, cause there are many different definitions out there, but one of the things I did was I, I took some time and, and actually wrote out something because I think it's really important that we kind of contextualize it in a very small but very succinct way. So I wrote this out. Mental health is the state of one's mind and how it affects their being. Mm. Mental health 
is the state of one's mind and how it affects their being. Um, it, it's the totality of how mm -hmm. we see our world system. Our mental health affects everything that is pertaining to how we get up in the morning, how we lay down, how we spend, how we save, how we interact, how we don't interact. So mental health is, is that, that state. Nice. And I think that's a very simplified definition, which um, beloveds can kind of walk away with. And this kind of frames our discussions even further. So um, before we jumped on the recording, you have mentioned something about discussing mental health within Black communities. Mm -hmm. And um, before we start talking about some of the other questions that I have, I want you to elaborate a little bit more. And just for some context, um, my audience is primarily white conservatives, okay. about 75 to 80 percent white conservatives. And um, I've just always been a part of this political space because my father was Republican and black. And this is just all we know. But you'll never catch us say anything dumb and colored. Oh, we're colorblind. We don't believe in. But nah, <laughs> we're going to help our communities. We love our communities. Uh, we just think conservatism is the better option. So. Um, I want white conservatives to understand some of the things that go on in the culture, not for them to get in the judgmental seat, but for them to become understanding, as well as them for, to understand that they have a lot of the same issues going on in their communities. It might appear a little bit differently, um, but if there's this way that we can bridge this gap, then we can start to build what I say is this great alliance. So I want you to talk for a moment about why mental health is kind of a stigma within our Black communities. And where do you think this comes from? I mean, is this a product of the church and some of the preachers? Is this something that is just, uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Let's get some clarity. So thank you so much again, Felicia. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I like to share when I'm speaking in regards to mental health is that it's a spectrum. And as we know, if there's a whole spectrum, there's a whole DSM-5, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, <clears throat> which is kind of like the Bible, if you will, of psychological coding and criterion. And it kind of helps us to be able to identify where we could say someone is um, anxiety, phobia, multiple personality, depression, you know, um, those types of things. One of the things that's really important, uh, I was um, asked to be a content expert for several communities <clears throat> in several counties in the area that I live in. And I was a content expert with the state to provide information for organizations as it pertains to African-Americans, African-American people, African-American churches, the faith-based organizations. One of the things that I came to understand in all of my research and my time is that Dr. Joy DeGruy was true in her book. She wrote the book, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. Uh, mm -hmm. And she's a college professor. And one of the things that people don't like to talk about is the systemic undertones of what slavery has done while we don't sit there and let it become the thing that overwhelms us, I think it's important that white conservatives understand it is still the rippling effect mm -hmm. of all of the institutional racism, all of the, you know, the um, sort of disenfranchisement that happens on the educational level, uh, job level, all of those types of things that still impact the way Blacks look at their lives, at their communities, and at themselves. That's one. The second piece is that mental health was not always easy for Blacks to be able to go into. There uh -huh. were plenty of times that African-Americans early on uh, were depressed, but could they be depressed when they had so much heavy burden and pressure to be something else? So there was always this coding that Blacks had had to go through to where they normalized the pain of depression, uh -huh. normalized the reality that you have given me a, a reality master. You've given me a reality boss. You've given me a reality that I'm a man. I'm strong, but not strong enough to take care of my family. Mm. So when I'm able to do the same work as someone else, you won't let me do it. Oh, you'll let me do it. But now I got to go through the back door 
I've got to be paid a dollar. They've been paying five. Uh, all of those things after a while starts to chisel at once mental faculties, white or black, but particularly black people because we're always constantly having to figure out where we stand. And when we finally get there, is it going to be enough? Hmm. Is it going to be enough? And so I think it's really important that the, the ways in which we look at uh, mental health and stigmatization, uh, the way you destigmatize it, number three, is that you've got to be willing to put the money and the investment into the various areas and also hire the individuals that look like those that need to be healed mentally. Mm. For years, I've been in this field for quite some time. Uh, very rarely did any of the students ever, I think I was the first black therapist that thousands mm. of black students and uh, folks saw for years. And that ought not be in the times that we live in. Even today, we have a lot more African-American therapists and people that are in mental health, but they have chosen to really segregate their own selves because the system kind of maneuvers and shuts them out and all kind of stuff. They get to one thing, well, you got to have this license. You're like, my God, I got eight degrees. How many more things do I need to do? When I see Sister Sally over here, and she doesn't even have a, a doctorate degree and she's not licensed, but her counseling center just was awarded $3 million. Is it because she's white? Is it because she's, what? what is, and these are the things that perpetuate, I think, the mental health disparities. It's the mm -hmm. constancy of like seeing something that's not right, wanting to make the change, being told change is happening, but seeing no change made. Mm. man that the, is the impact of that yeah. just by itself and i know yeah. you know what i'm talking about yeah. the constancy yeah. of you talking about being black and conscious and and really understanding conservatism uh and looking at your your belief systems and matching them up with how you're going to impact your community you know it's one thing to say all those things but it's another thing if the reality can't match up because now we've got a bunch of other things opposing it that's kind of how one's mind works when they're un under heavy mental health pressure and cannot get relief. Wow. Now you said a lot, and I'm going to try and dissect some of this for um, beloveds who will be watching. Some of the trigger words on the right are like institutional racism, yes. systemic racism, racism as itself. Um, these are these are trigger words on the right. And my fellow colleague, Sonny Johnson and myself have done extensive work with the space to teach them that systemic racism is real. I just define it as progressivism. So mm -hmm. see, white conservatives hate the word progressivism because to us, we understand it means bigger government, which means bigger systems which means, as you were saying, the system that is putting all of these barriers on you to have these licenses, the degrees, da 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 da, da. But Sister Sally doesn't have to have it. So they have to understand what we're talking about in the context of the language that they, that they use themselves. And so I've been able to be successful by saying, no, we're talking about systems. We're not yeah. talking about you. We're not talking about your white wife. We're talking about systems. Absolutely. And when they study, those who are brave enough to do it, when they study the history of progressivism, which has been around for a hundred plus years, then they understand that it's the government. It's the government system in all of these various areas that would create racist policies like black codes, or would create, you know, the whole Jim Crow era, you're talking about a hundred plus years, just smack out of being slaves. Like black folks had a, a whopping 10 years to be free <laughs> before they locked them back up and had the whole public basically making them slaves or second class citizens. So it's like, I've learned how to talk to my people, <laughs> my white conservatives, in a manner that helps them to understand. And one of the things that we do with the movement is try and bridge this gap. So like 
in our discussion right now, it's like, you're telling me these stories and what's happening. I'm the bridge. And then here's white conservatives. They'll be able to understand what you're trying to say yeah. when someone is a, a mediator or an interpreter, <laughs> if that makes sense. Right. And so I want them to understand that when black folks, experts, um, specialists are talking about mental health issues and when they do incorporate now i'm talking to the white conservatives when we do incorporate discussions about systemic racism or whatnot understand that these are real factors that have to be considered so like if a youth is let's talk about the there's this new jersey law where um youth have to have a license to ride a bicycle that is insane but they have to have a license to ride a bicycle and if they don't then the police get to harass them so i told conservatives this is a type of progressive oppression because now instead of and, and they'll say oh this is for safety reasons child we've been riding our bikes without a license forever this is not a safety reason this is a tax benefit <laughs> to the police to help them get more funding I said, so when there's a greater increase of government in these local areas, it actually turns the citizens into new criminals. So now instead of being able to ride their bike freely, they have to worry about, oh man, did I leave my license for my stupid little bike at home? Why is this police harassing me? This plays into the psyche. Now that's something that my daughter would never experience out here in Atlanta. We ain't trying to do nothing. <laughs> Georgia is not going to do that to us. So mental health is not going to look the same for her as it would in New Jersey, who's being her. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes sense. Yeah. And so I want conservatives to understand we're, we're talking again about the systems and how they prevent American citizens. This is for all my colorblind conservatives <laughs> who like that. Think about this just being American citizens in this country, not being able to exercise certain freedoms that someone else would in a different state. The, this is how we break it down for them. And so I wanted to highlight that because you did mention the phrase uh, institutional racism. It's like they have to understand it in a way that's going to click for them yes. so that eventually they'll say, you know what? I don't like like if there's a conservative in New Jersey, they would say, I don't like these laws that are making the citizens appear to be new criminals. I'm going to go run for office. I'm going to win. I'm going to get this policy off their back. This is what I want conservatives to start doing, to start getting active. And so the only way they'll be able to do it is if they can see what we see, but in but using their lens, if that makes any kind of sense. Totally makes sense. Yeah. So of the, because you kind of did a, a general uh, um, understanding about mental health issues in the Black community, what are some of the main challenges? What are some, some diagnoses? I don't even know if I said that correctly, but what are some of the main issues that you see happening in our communities today? Well, you know, they, they overlap. I mean, when you start looking at the intersection of mental health, you cannot not look at the policies and the things around mental health and the policies that are just gendered for America. Uh, you know, one of the conversations I'll be having really soon here is mental health in America and really looking at the schizophrenic reaction that we have to things when things have broken down and they're not working well. Well, one of the things that's really important in African-American community, trauma is very, very, very prevalent. Trauma is sincere, trauma on every level. You've got trauma abuse in the education system, workplace system, uh, and really the differentiating aspects of that level of trauma is not just a lower income or a, a higher social economic income. It's across the board for African Americans. Some African Americans that have been at the highest level of their life are still dealing with the lowest level of interaction, and yet they've been performing well. We just saw that with uh, the uh, new, uh, who's now the new Supreme Court uh, judge. Uh, we saw the whole thing. I mean, you know, you look at her record and just for record's sake, you know, even Jesus was like, look, uh, for their very work's sake, you may not like them, but for at least for their work's sake, you ought to applaud them for at least for what they what they have done, what they can't do. Right. And so so since, you know, Jesus sort of gave that push, many people can't. So the trauma for black folks 
is huge. That's that's a, a major um, sort of mental health disparity. Depression. See, I have a theory and a thought about depression. I did a lot of research and study when I was at Cal Berkeley and all that good stuff. And I love that. I love the opportunity. I went to Cal Berkeley. I was 17 years old. and and But God, he gave me all these th thoughts and ideas. And, and he told me what my purpose was and, and, and that I was designed to help to really radically help to change the way that we see behavioral health care systems. Because it's the system that's not working for the people. Right now, we're in a major mental health uh, pandemic that is bubbling over that people are not speaking to. Uh, it, COVID is one thing, but uh, the mental health pandemic's been here and now it's getting ready to explode all the systems that have been put in place to do something, but not really help. Mm. Therefore, uh, African-Americans are gonna be the brunt of that. So you got the trauma, you got the abuse, you got the major depression and black people's depression looks a little different from white folks' depression. Black people's depression is homicidal. Mm. That mm. depression is suicidal, right? We're suicidal in the way in which we spend. We're suicidal in the way in which we interact. We're suicidal in the way in which we we maneuver, right? Black people's depression, no, I, I can't really lay in the bed all day, but I will become a hundred pounds overweight in four months and nobody asks me nothing. Yeah, mm. I, I, I will know that I can't eat at 12 o'clock midnight, but uh, black people's depression is different. They, they can't lay down when when you're now taking care of your children and your children's children. So black folks got to get up. But now my interaction with people is short. I'm angry all the time. And what you see or what you've labeled angry black woman, you know, kind of a thing, right? And you're like, no, I'm not angry. I'm really depressed because depression is sadness turned inwards. Mm. Depression is when we take our sadness and turn it inward. We don't have the wherewithal to put it where it belongs. So now we just turn it back inward. And then that inward feeling weighs us down. And for most folks, we either, um, you know, really operate in a way, a way that does not allow us to be our maximum self, or we just stop functioning at all. We start going to substance. We start doing other kinds of stuff. So, so those are the things, trauma, abuse, depression, um, uh, we talk about PTSD, post-traumatic, you know, stress disorder. And I did this, uh, training, uh, well, actually it was a conference actually. And we had, uh, Dr. Uh, or Reverend, um, Wanda Johnson was my guest. And then we also had Gwen Carr, who was the mother of, um, Gardner, Eric Gardner. And we had all these other people at this event. It was called, uh, the PTSD of being black. 312 people showed up on Super Bowl Sunday. I totally forgot it was Super Bowl Sunday <laughs> a couple of years ago. And 312 people showed up. But what it told me why they showed up is because there is a PTSD in Black people that is not being talked about. Can you imagine? Even myself. I've been in the car and I got stopped by cops a couple of years back, me and my children. The car uh, was fine a little bit of an older car, and my children were in their seats. So was slumped over. The officer starts going off. And in my spirit, I had the window down just a little bit. I said, I can hand you my license, all of that. He says, you're an unfit mother. He went in on me. That your son's not buckled in here. I said, he is buckled in, sir. We just came from a long trip. He probably just took the, this part and put it, you know, but he had, was all buckled in the whole bit. And long story of, this, of, of the whole story, my son was probably about four or five, five years old at the time, maybe, yeah, five or six. It changed his perspective about police officers forever. My children are biracial. And so uh, the officer made us get out of the car, leave the car there. I had on five inch heels made us walk. We had about two, three miles. I was on my way to drop the kids off to their sitter so I could go to work. We had to walk. So I can, and with dignity in my, I had my one kid here and the other was holding that other kid's hand. I did not want my kids to see me crying. So I just walked. He, the officers ranted all kinds of stuff. That instance forever changed my whole being about systems. Mm -hmm. uh, totally. Of course, because I'm a little bit more knowledgeable. There was a phone call made. There was a complaint made. And and, and the sheriffs 
a uh, person came out to my house, left his information. Then I had a whole meeting uh, in the city that I'm in um, and had a whole meeting with all these officers. And they were like, we're so sorry. I said, it's Dr. Long. There I was a mother, but here we're going to, I said, you have no idea the irreparable, irreparable damage that you have created. I now have to every day pray that my children become unlearned about how you treated their mother who was unarmed and willing, you know? So I said all that to say that it's those egregious types thing that never get corrected that creates conflict for black people around mm -hmm. mental health. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That story, it, it, it fits so well with a lot of the narratives that come up on the right. And so one of the fallacies on the right is every time a black person gets pulled over, then they automatically did something wrong. That's the narrative that we get on this side until they start to get pulled over or harassed at the park for not wearing a mask. I said, now, see, y'all got harassed for two years. Now you imagine a hundred plus years with that all the time in your neighborhood. I said, that's Black Americans in these progressive areas. So we're at a point where, like, I don't think I could have this conversation with you if it was a year ago or two years ago. But the fact that we can have this conversation and I can bring it to my platform shows the progression and how um, far along conservatives have come because they've had to taste it for themselves. I mean, I, you and I can laugh at it and say it's just a darn mask on your face. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you laugh, but for somebody else, it's, 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 uh, it's something else. Yeah. And so we can laugh at it. We can say, well, try getting lynched or try getting harassed by the police or try getting laws that literally prevent you from entering the successful economic. I said, try that. You guys could not handle it. I can tell you can't handle it because the masks are throwing you in a tipsy, but this is fine. I can play with it. I can work with this. And so it's like this helps give perspective. And this is one of the reasons why I love qualitative data. Now, I have a master's degree in education. So one of the I had to do my thesis and I decided to use qualitative data research in order to convey wh whatever my argument was. And qualitative data just basically gets stories from the people themselves. And I tell them, you know, I tell conservatives, if the stories that I'm presenting to you match the quantitative data, in other words, the numbers, then you have an accurate assessment of what's happening in our communities. And so you val your story just now validated what a lot of the data say concerning how black folks feel that there's strong police brutality in their areas. And so sometimes conservatives interpret police brutality as a, a, a cop shooting and killing somebody. But police brutality is what you just went through. Yes. Or, you know, police brutality is getting hit in the face or pushed to the... Like that's the brutality of the police. And I've had to tell conservatives, the police is just an extension of progressive, the system itself. So all this back the blue, I support the police, blah, blah, blah. I tell them, okay, until that system, until the blue comes and attacks you, then all of a sudden you need to think about, do you still back this blue? And this is no shot against the servants in our communities who do great work in terms of protecting our communities, yes. because um, there's data that proves black Americans don't want a decrease in police force. They actually want um, a slight increase. They just want it to be a community service. They don't want to be harassed and bothered. And so it's like, we're not saying defund the police or anything like that. They're just saying there has to be something done within these systems and institutions which are causing chaos between officers and community members. That's the problem that we're seeing right here. And it all goes back to the system or progressivism. And so you have you've had a chance. We're kind of out of COVID now in the pandemic. We're like post COVID. Right. Did you notice a. A, a massive difference um, in the negative way among Black communities or Black Americans? And how did COVID affect the mental health? 
Oh my God. I don't even think we had enough time. It has affected the black community in a lot of ways because we have the, the folks who said, take the vaccine. We have people who said, don't, don't take the vaccine. And they named it something different. They said the fix or the, no, not the fix, you know, um, it's something else going on. Conspiracy theorists and this, that, the other, and everybody had their thoughts. Uh, or you had the, the, the black pastors who were adamant about utilizing their churches to do different things for the COVID. And you had other blacks who said, why would you do that? The, do you remember the Tuskegee, you know, experiment, like wake up, smell the coffee, and we're still being experimented on and all of these things, right? Stuff that people don't want to talk about. That's not really a conspiracy theory uh, when you can trace it back to actual facts and figures. So anything that has facts and figures, <laughs> like Dr. Betty Shabazz, so, you know, I love her dearly and God bless her soul. You know, she was just one of those women that just felt and 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 stated, say what you want to, but at the end of the day, you go follow the numbers and the numbers don't <laughs> lie. The numbers tell us whatever you're trying to make me think that ain't happening, it says something different over here on Siler Street. Siler mm -hmm. says that every other house, somebody's struggling financially, but they working just as much as Jojo is our sister Sally is, but they're not bringing home the same. And not because she don't save. That's the only way that she survives it because she saves. It's because she's got $3 while she got one and a half. So we've got all kinds of things going on. And even right now, you know, just, yes, lots of people were benefited, African Americans, for the Small Business Association and Small Business Loans. But I know a lot of businesses that did not get any of that and it wasn't that their business wasn't put together well though after a while when it was starting to fizzle out or fizzle down uh the, the, the calls were not being answered as prompt anymore their applications was just stuck in queue in queue land um so their businesses were fighting businesses that are needed in the community right so it it is affected the black community in a way like i like to say it like this the black community, I think, it's just me, is already struggling to have the voice of not just a leader, but a voice of someone who is influential and who's convicted by what he or she believes long enough to convert those who have no belief. Mm -hmm. yeah, belief in God, belief in the systems that will work. Um, and so where we're at as a black American people is there's this infighting that is going on of uh, the haves and the have nots. Mm -hmm. I know more, you should follow me. And I'm saying to myself, yeah, you may have more, but the words that you say tell me you don't know more. Mm. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, in yeah. all of your getting, you ought to be able to get an understanding. I hear you saying something, but it's not provoking me to have an understanding that I might have long life. The scripture tells us very much so that when you are wise, you're going to have longevity. As a matter of fact, that when you are wise, you speak less and you listen more. And mm. a lot of blacks are talking a lot more, being asked to talk more, being asked to speak up, but they have no power, no authority, no leadership skills, and no ability to follow through without the assistance of someone else. And so then what we have is this perpetuation of something looking like it's progressing, but mm. there's no movement at all. Because for me, movement is when you get up to say and or do, stuff happens because people believe in you, they believe yeah. in the process, that is a movement. You get people who otherwise would not do anything, whether they can barely make it or not. That's when you know I've got a movement. Yeah. Other than that, Black people have got to really uh, decide which way we're going to go and, and how long are we going to be uh, kind of playing the middle field? Just a little yeah, bit. that's that's amazing how you brought up what's happening in the you talk about the infighting and it seems like there's this, you know, the crabs in the barrel kind of phenomenon where someone's getting attention here. So let's pull that down or but there's no real structure. And this actually reminds me of this new movement that uh, my movement has partnered with. They're called the um, the American Freedmen 
something something. I'm still learning about them. But basically, they are kind of like ADOS, which is trying to um, categorize Black Americans who were descendants of freed men yes. as a, uh, a separate group who are entitled to certain restorative policies. I love the way they talk about reparations because it's not something that we typically hear. So as they're talking, I noticed that um, because I started promoting them more on Twitter, some of their followers would come and they would see conservative. <laughs> they would see, you know, like, oh, I don't know about her. And she, da, 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 da. And I'm like, the worst thing you could do right now is make me and my movement an enemy. I say, because you don't have access. You don't have access over here at all. There's no doorway for Black Americans to come on the right and to say, hey, we have this thing popping over here in this city. You know, Coach Felicia, is there something that the movement can do? All I got to do is tweet something. And the overlords in the RNC get all nervous. So I know my power, right? And so I'm like, Black Americans ought to know to whom they can contact, to whom they can say, you know what, let me message, you know, my media manager, her name is Nicole. Let me call Nicole and see if she can ask Coach Felicia to do da-da-da-da-da. That is what we need when we when we say access is important, when we say having that power is important. This is what I'm talking about when it comes to the conscious conservative movement. So I tell folks like the Freedmen folks, I said, it's great for you to have ideas. It's great for you to set up your nonprofit and to get that foundation. But what are you going to do when it's time to act? What kind of access do you have? I said, if you don't have access, then the number one thing you need to do is become friends <laughs> with movements that have access, whether it's on the right, which we have with the conscious conservative movement, or if it's on the left, which I still, they still won't tell me who their access point is over there. So um, whatever. But it's like, it goes back to what you're saying, that there's this conflict of, you know, there's just not, there's no Dr. King. Now, you know, I have my own, go ahead, go ahead. But, and, and, and I just got to say why I think there's no Dr. King. Okay, right? go. Tell us. Because I really, and I, I, I studied his life, and I love the way in which his story gets narrated to us, the world. Here it is. Although he had all kinds of stuff going on, he had a little bit of depression going on early on in his life. People do not mm. know that piece. Uh, but he was so smart, skipped a grade, then skipped another grade, which is why he was able to graduate uh, from high school. He was 15, then went on, got his uh, degree, undergraduate. By the time he was 22, 23, he had his PhD doctorate, and he was good to go. Here is why there's not another Dr. King. He was willing to read all sorts of books, come up with his own thoughts and theories. He read books, Karl Marx, uh, you know, I, and I love Karl, I've read Karl Marx, you know, you bring up all the other stuff people don't really know about me, but I was very heavily politically involved uh, my first probably 24 years uh, from the age of maybe like 14 and 20, about 20 years after that. Um, and so he, he liked chemistry and he liked various other things and intertwined it. He didn't have a problem talking to white people. He didn't care that they didn't like what he had to say. He wasn't easily offended. He just was focused on what he knew that wasn't so much just about black people's agenda. I love him because it's about people's agenda that keeps getting messed up because of one person's agenda or a group of mm. people's agenda towards a group of people. Yeah. The whole aspect is at the end of the day, is what you're saying going to resonate to everyone who is affected? It's more than mm. just black people who are in prison enslaved. We got mm. the poor white folks too, that are also feeling some kind of way about how their life is going and whatnot. And what Dr. King did was he told us, he showed us that be powerful, be knowledgeable, stay humble, but your greatest weapon is knowledge, mm -hmm. information, and use every platform in its proper perspective. Mm -hmm. Like this is a platform. Use yeah. everything in its proper perspective. We don't have time to bash because truth will always do the capturing. 
truth yeah. will always do the revealing. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so he just was a master at his words and how he expressed it. And so, you know, for that, you know, too many people have too many agendas about, I need to tell you my truth. No, no, live out your truth. Mm -hmm. Let that be your eulogy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So before he died, we were, he was already living his death, Dr. King was. And so I think until we as leaders, that our leaders can do the same, well, we're gonna, we're gonna run into some things. Yeah, I, I, I love it. It's brilliant. I always, I, I tell folks, you know, I have my own philosophical issues with Dr. King. Yes. Um, I said, but the thing I respect is his ability to flex access. Like yes. the, the people at the very top weren't calling the everyday black Americans. They yes. had to keep an eye on Dr. King. And that's the kind of power that I mean when I say access is necessary. Love it. So that if, you know, I'm not in the mental health field, but let's say your voice just kind of rose to the top, then black people would know, okay, I can somehow contact Lakita's team. And she knows someone over here at this point who can get resources over here. Like it's, been, it's being able to finesse the system. There we go. Yes. And realizing the system is not going to go anywhere. There's no dismantling it. It's, it's been here forever. But there's a way to finesse it. And that's what I do. That's what my team does when it comes to politics, conservative politics on behalf of Black Americans. We'll finesse this thing. We'll get white conservatives to ally. Like I don't, when I do fundraising or when I do, you know, trying to connect with white conservatives, I don't use white guilt. I don't tell them they're oppressors and, they, you know, their, their whiteness is somehow affecting affected my mind. I just don't go there, right? I just tell them, like, you have some of the same issues that Black Americans have. They don't like big government on their neck. They don't like being harassed. You guys don't like being harassed. How about you get together and form a posse and get involved at local politics so that you can get these regulations off? And so this has been really productive. This has actually helped white conservatives who constantly get battered in the political streets. They get called racist all the time. They, they're constantly on the defense, you know? And so it's like, y'all got some of your own mental health issues, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, how can we get to the point where we're having these good, healthy conversations? And like I said, I probably would not have been able to have this chat with you a year or two years ago, but this lets you know where they're at right now. Um, this transitions into the next question. So I know oftentimes um, when we're talking about mental health, it's easier for women to, you know, say, you know, let's talk mental health issues and depression and whatnot. But it seems to me just on the outside that men struggle with admitting that there's mental health issues within their sphere or they, it just doesn't seem like there's a lot of discussion about men and mental health. So can you talk to us about the gender dynamic and why is it that black men, uh, or even white men, men in general, have a, an, an issue with this particular um, factor? Well, I think it's really important to identify that right now as it pertains to mental health, uh, when we look at suicidality, we still see that the rise and the increase of suicide amongst African-Americans has risen more than 75 plus percent uh, mm. across the board, but the, it's the highest uh, way that young people are dying between the ages of 13 uh, through 24. Um, and what the other portion that's really important is that right now there's this kind of uh, undercurrent campaign that's going on amongst African-American men who are coming out more about their mental health. But there are many factors as to why they cannot or why they feel like they cannot, right? So so one of those things is I had did this um, sort of seminar. I'm always doing something off the cuff. And I did this seminar uh, called When Men Hurt, When Men Hurt. And uh, all these men showed up. It was like at least almost 200. Uh, and then some sisters sprinkled in there, you know. Uh, but it, they they shared with us that it was the first time they felt heard it was the first time they felt able to express in a safe space. And the need for them to be able to do that to whether it's cry or to scream uh, and not feel judged by doing either, particularly when they've got to 
walk outside their house. I want you to picture this. Walk outside their house and their whole being is a red dot target. Can you imagine? So that anyone that does not care for what that person is wearing, looking like, or whatever, they're a target for the day, a target for, um, you know, just your turn to, to go pay for your food. Well, you just had a great attitude with the person in front of me. And now I come up and say, hey, how you doing? Um, what would you like? Okay. You know, what's going on? <laughs> what just happened? You was just cheering for the, for the last four or five people. Is it because, you know? And so men just have a hard time. And we don't make it easier in America with all the brutality going on, with all of the the stuff about, uh, you know, single parent homes. And believe it or not, now this is really interesting. Uh, believe it or not, truthfully, when you start looking at the numbers, more men are taking their children and being single parent families as a man than the other way around. So, so there's a whole lot of dynamic, but they don't get the same respect. They're fought more mm. if they want to go and get their children. It's just, it's all backwards. It's all, it's all, you'd rather give, uh, have the children, watch this, it's a true story and several stories like this. The, the children, they, they rather the courts to keep the children in a foster care uh, so that it give the drug addict mom time to get cleaned up. But the stable, educated father who is capable of taking care of the children can't get the children. Mm. So you're going to wait till six months, maybe, that the mother gets off drugs, keep them in foster care where all kind of damnable things is happening in foster care. I don't care what you say. A touch here, a touch there. You know, all the stories of the, the young people. And so now men are feeling like they're not just fighting a system that um, it's got some issues about whatever they got issues about, but now they're fighting women's rights. Uh, they're fighting so many, you're a man, you shouldn't be wanting to be a single parent. Well, I, who says that? Why would you say it? I'm a married man who's capable of taking care of my two children. And why am I being fought to do that? Only so you could say in three years, see, he didn't take care of his children. But you told me I couldn't. You, you put a restraining order on me that I couldn't. Mm. You, you, I went up to the kid's school not knowing you put a place in order that I have no educational rights. When did that happen? I don't know. I've been sending you money for the last 10 years. These are the stories that I hear of men showing me receipts. No, I send them $3,000 a month. So whether she go to work or not, you know, in a, you know, Atlanta or Alabama, $3,000 a month, you can do something with that. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so those are the things that our men are going through. Wow. And until they're able to, and I can go more and more and more because my first professorship uh, assignment was at the jail. I took an uh, assignment. Uh, it's so funny how God works. Uh, a white woman, Dr. Chris Moyers, I wasn't even finished with my master's degree. She says, you would be great. And I'm going to enroll you into this adjunct professor uh, intern program. And I says, great. I was about two, three months out from, uh, you know, getting my master's degree. And she says, you're going to be a professor and you're going to be under my department, which is so sociology. Uh, my, my minor is sociology and all that good stuff. And so I did. And my first professorship for the first three years was uh, creating a whole life skills program for more than 1,500 men uh, mm. at the Santa Rita Jail. And that is what probably allowed me to create programs for both incarcerated men that I've, I've created, as well as the probation officers as well. So I've been able to be on both sides and which is my love. And so men, men got a tough little role. They got a tough yeah. role. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, I'm thinking about some of the stereotypes of black men on the right like Debbie fathers and all these single moms, all these uh, uh, children without fathers. I'm like, just say bastard. Stop playing with me. You know, yes. that's that's what you really want to say. Exactly. And um, we've had to share with them the data. I said, according to CDC, black men are the most active fathers in their children's lives. And so the facts, the data, the stories are conflicting with white conservatives preconceived notions that have been fed to them through mainstream conservative media outlets. Yes. And one of the things we stress to our audience is the need and the importance of fellowship. And so it's like, if 
if you're not going to have conversations with black folks, then you're never going to know what's taking place. If you're not listening to their stories, you're not going to understand how the same policies or the same systems are oppressing the both of you, both groups. Um, and so it's just very interesting to hear how uh, men in general are dealing with systemic racism or systemic oppression, because I'm sure white men can tell us some different stories about how they have to deal with the, the family courts and this, that, and the other. So it's it's just okay. like, it's like, okay, guys, I hope y'all see the commonality here. Now, can we build this alliance? Like, can we finally come together and say, all right, the government is up to something. Let's figure out what we can do. And that has truly been our success. Go, go for it. Yeah, yeah. And, and let me say, uh, you know, just as you said it, I had pictured a, uh, a men's group that uh, where men were trying to have visitation rights for their children. And um, I remembered all the white men in the room and the black men. Uh, but in that room, everybody's leveled. Yeah. And everybody respected and saw each other. We're the same. They treat you like that too? Yeah, man. I go to work. I'm a construction worker. I get off. I do all these things. And then they tell me I can. So when you said that the camaraderie amongst white and black, when the playing field is leveled, uh, you could feel the synergy and the energy. Mm -hmm. of the. It's what uh, the society and politics feeds the nation that creates the divide. And it's what people will receive mm -hmm. once it's fed to them. Mm -hmm. Everything, as my mother would always say, listen to it all. But if you can't chew it and swallow it, spit it out. Keep it moving. <laughs> <laughs> I love the elders. <laughs> I mean, and, and both of my, my parents are deceased. My father was born in 1925. So his story is valid. Mm. His story is, is huge. His story is major. So I've got all these stories that they have shared with me that lets me know something else is going on here. Yes. Stop here. Let's dig a little bit more and find out who are you really trying to get me to go against? Because yes. right now, <laughs> yes. Yes. It, 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 no, no, no. You want me to be angry about something. Let me figure out who you want me to be angry with. Yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh <laughs> and I think once conservatives understand that part, like, you know what, somebody else, this is something sinister, then they can remove that next layer, that barrier that's between them and Black voters or Black Americans. And that's what I want to continue to bring. I mean, it's interesting that we kind of merged mental health with politics because we're talking policies, right? We're talking about systems and how these systems affect mental health. And this is kind of like, you know, we can't separate I tell beloveds, for me, I can't separate the spirit from anything else. Like kingdom principles are always going to be injected in everything. But now we can see how even systems are affecting mental health in various communities. And if there's a way for us to develop something locally that will not even be like if the government has to get involved, write a check. Write a check to the organizations that are already doing something at the local level. That's probably the most government I will accept. Other than that, I don't want the government near me, right? I would rather somebody like you or other therapists or um, doctors like you to come to Decatur, Georgia and to host, you know, a, a, a mental health conference. Like that to me is much more powerful than, yes, you know, folks going to the nearby county office to sign up for whatever, whatever. Like I need, I need local folks. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, and here's the thing. I think you said something and it just jarred my, my mind before uh, we get out of here, but uh, the, the mental health system, the behavioral health care system is very, very antiquated. It mm. really does not work. And I currently work for a major corporation as well. And out of a thousand employees, I am the second and only executive leader uh, there. And my role uh, is to create the, I'm the director of operations for the intensive outpatient programming and group therapy uh, services. So my job is to actually create this whole um, intensive outpatient program. What is, and that's for people who 
need higher levels of care. So that's not just somebody that I need to go to therapy. This is somebody that's starting to really show a decline on their job, in their families, or they're having more bouts of suicidality. So my job is to create a program that folks can come to and get the help that they need. So one of the things out the gate that I said to the folks is that, listen, everybody's doing this. Everybody, especially since the pandemic, everybody has gone telehealth. Everybody's gone. It doesn't mean that the way they've gone is the way that's going to work for a long period of time. I firmly believe, which my master's uh, uh, thesis and my doctoral dissertation, I firmly believe you really can't do therapy without the use of spirituality. You cannot. I have uh, been fortunate to work and be the only black therapist in all white areas. And one of the things that people, my uh, superiors were astonished about was that, wow, they had been coming here for three, four years. They were seeing so and so and so, but man, their mental health clarity, they were with you or working with you six months, eight months. And what was the difference? I says, it's the way in which you, me, we hold them as a therapist. How I hold people in my head is very different. How you hold, you hold them as being sick. I mm. don't. Mm. I don't. I don't hold them as being sick. I hold them as having a discontinued effort of being well. Mm. Very different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> a discontinued effort of being well. In which my, my whole thought process is to help them to Give their story as it is, whatever way it is. Now, let me show them through the process where the gaps are and why they keep stepping into the emotional potholes. It's Mm. because they did not know they needed to insert this in order to get there. And once they learn that, then they can move on. But the system is so antiquated. If you call to get some mental health services with insurance and you're now on a wait list for eight months, what? Uh, do, oh, easily, easily. Uh, and, who, and who has $150 to go outside for mm-hmm. the, the insurance? So we just need to change some stuff. And then we're uh, constantly telling people you're depressed. Now, while uh, the, a job can't actually access that information. Well, you know, we thought that was true when COVID hit. Well, they sure can't access a whole lot of forms and HIPAA. <laughs> That's a whole other yeah. I, was, I was like, wow, the violation of all my civil liberties. Well, this is getting interesting. I was like, I didn't even know that my seventh, eighth, ninth grade U.S. history courses was really starting to come into play now. All of the laws and all of the amendments <laughs> you had to learn. I was like, oh my God, why is this coming back up? Well, the third and fourth and sixth amendment and all of this stuff because uh, we're playing games. And as long as you mm. play games, uh, people will never see what's actually really happening with people that cannot afford to play games when they've mm-hmm. got to be serious. So we've got a long ways to go, but if you want some help, I, listen, I've got tons of ideas that require a little bit of financial backing and, yeah. uh, and, and uh, get some good help, which I know a bunch of folks across this country, and you will see a change in behavioral yeah. health care. So uh, I would love to have that conversation with anybody. And yeah. you will test pilot, for this, do test pilot for your state. I guarantee you, <laughs> you'll be like, what is going on? You'll say, what is going on? You got to put the proper money, the proper providers. And mm-hmm. guess what? Some of those providers might not be licensed, but they may mm-hmm. be trained with learned experience understanding the spirit of people and all the other aspects mm-hmm. and helping people to go from hurt to healed. Mm-hmm. That's the place. Yeah. And you that can't is. do that if you deny people the opportunity to do it in a space that works for them. Yeah, man. Oh, Dr. Lakita, you know, I, I can go on and on, but I need to respect your time. I want you to come back um, next I'd month to get this um, going again, because I, I want beloveds to understand, again, we're dealing with social, political, and economic issues. And uh, there's just a better way for us to handle things. And it's much easier when there's someone tangible like you that we can go to and purchase your books or hire your services or yes. get on a phone call with you as opposed to waiting eight months, child, please. <laughs> That's crazy. Yes. But it just makes things closer to home 
and we call this, you know, practicing the Republic. Uh, it's more localized. And so I, I just absolutely love you. And thank you so very much for being here. I want you to tell everyone where they can find you. Tell us about your services, your books, anything yeah. like that. So uh, thank you so much. Once again, it's really been an honor. You have totally just spark some other stuff inside of me, which is how things should be. And it just, uh, it lets me know how much I love the work that I do, which is really trying to make people more conscious about the need for mental health um, and spiritual enhancement in their life. Um, so you can follow me. Uh, I'm on all various social medias. Uh, I've written about nine books in total, and uh, they are all on Amazon. We've got a couple of books that are coming out uh, here uh, in a couple of months. Uh, you can go to our site, LakitaLong.org. That's LakitaLong.org. You could also go to our site, uh, LDLEmpowermentGroup.com. And we have uh, an institute it's called the LDL Empowerment Institute, which is a, a learning, training, coaching form that allows people in the areas of personal development, mental health, wellness, as well as um, spiritual development to be able to be whole from the inside out. And we're looking at what ways do we take the sacred and help the secular. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that really is my forte and my, my experience that you really can't do um, the sacred well. I mean, you can't do the secular well without the sacred. The secular will always need the sacred, always, mm -hmm. to keep people balanced, humane, and in truth. But the sacred doesn't need the secular necessarily because mm -hmm. in it, it finds everything it needs. Isn't that powerful? Yes. Right? That's just so powerful, right? You know, and so uh, I'm just excited to just be here. It's really an honor. It's a, it's just, uh, it's a blessing. And, and, and I'm just glad to be able to share. And I hope that some information we'll share that people can learn. We can always have another conversation or even get more specific and, and things of that nature to talk about policies and turnovers and, and things that we could do, you know, on a local level, um, even school-wise, I've created programs in schools. There's so many different ways that we can address what we got going on, but let's not wait because folks yeah. is wanting to end their life every seven minutes. So mm -hmm. we, we want to be able to try to see how we can interject that and be yeah. here. That is absolutely amazing. Beloved, mind you, I have like two or three other questions, but I'm like, <laughs> I need to respect the doctor's time. I, I have to bring you back next month. And I, I know that this uh, virtual summit was designed specifically for women, but I really think a lot of men are going to uh, be blessed by it. And if women, if you're watching this, you know, share this video with your husband or your son, yeah. your fathers. Um, because I think once we get a better understanding of what's taking place, then we can move forward, right? We can progress. And um, I want the conscious conservative movement to be that number one hub where folks can come to get the insight that they need. So um, Dr. Lakita, thank you once again. And I send a blessing to you. I send a blessing you. to your organization, you. uh, praying for whatever it is you need, clients, whatever yeah. it is, opportunities, doors. Um, I just pray that this platform helps create that for you as well. Thank you so, so much. And much blessings to you. I learned from you. You're like the the conscious, you know, workbook that I read every time your emails are like, whoa, that's a long email. So I make time to read it all the way through. And I'm like, whoa, she is not playing. This girl is moving and shaking. And it just kind of put things into perspective. And it keeps those of us who are on the front lines doing other stuff, making sure we don't forget the stuff in the back. So thank you for the work that you're doing, being consciously motivated and moving towards something rather than consciously stagnated, sitting on everything. So thank you so much. Blessings to you guys. And thank you guys for all having me. All right. You take care. Thank you so much.